Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional materials available on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an anonymous chat session, allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. All of the efforts of Telema Press, including this lecture, are made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Help us to help humanity by making a donation. Telema Press is a non-profit corporation. Donations are tax-deductible. For more information, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Welcome to today's lecture. We're going to enter into studying some fundamental aspects of Gnosis or Gnosticism, which may be a little bit unfamiliar to Western students. We're going to talk about the Gnostic Buddha. And to initiate this discussion, this lecture, I first want to emphasize that there are many variations, many varieties of Buddhism, many threads of that teaching which emerged after the appearance of the historical figure that we're going to discuss today. And as such, you might find contradictions. And I offer apologies to those who are scholars of Buddhism or who are well-versed in one tradition or another. Because you may discover that much of what we discuss today will be unfamiliar to you. And I would remind you of one of the central facets of the Buddha's original teaching, which is that the monk, the student, the disciple, should always keep his bowl turned upright and empty. In other words, the mind should remain receptive, empty, with the ability to receive new information and new understanding at all times. The great Gnostic teacher, Samael Anvior, made a statement which is essential for us to deeply understand. In a lecture entitled The Esoteric Path, he said this, Unquestionably, the two greatest leaders of all time are Buddha Shakyamuni and Jesus Christ. Of course, Western students will be more or less familiar with the story of Jesus But it's important to, at the very beginning, recognize that both these words, or these titles, Jesus Christ and Buddha Shakyamuni, these are both titles. They're not 
personal names. These aren't uh, names given at birth. These are titles that are earned. And in their depth, they have comparable or complementary meanings. Buddha, Shakyamuni, and Jesus Christ. Of course, the title, Jesus Christ, we've discussed many times. And this title is explained throughout the writings of Samael and Vior and the many lectures that have been given in this tradition. Buddha Shakyamuni is also a title whose meaning we'll discuss today. To begin, to set a foundation for this lecture, I want to relate another passage from the same lecture, The Esoteric Path. Where Samael on the Or relates an experience that he had in which he gave a speech, a talk in a Buddhist monastery in Japan. And in this Buddhist monastery, Samael on Vior spoke about Christ. And he was teaching the Buddhist monks about Christ. And due to that, Since he was speaking about a Christian point of view rather than a Buddhist point of view, there was a kind of scandal or a controversy among the disciples of that temple. And Samael expected to be rebuked by the master of the temple, by the abbot. So the abbot of the temple approached Samael and said, Why did you speak on behalf of Christ, knowing that this is a Buddhist monastery? And Samael answered, with the most profound respect to the sacred institution, I have to emphatically affirm that Buddha and Christ complement each other. And Samael says he expected a response from the master's point of view, a Buddhist point of view. But with great amazement, the Buddha, or the master agreed. And the Buddhist abbot said, indeed, Buddha and Christ complement each other. And he asked for a thread, for a cord, a piece of string. And when they brought it to him, he asked Samael, show me your right hand. And the master then tied the thread around the thumb of Samael's right hand. Then he tied the other end of the thread to Samael's left thumb. And so tied the two thumbs with this piece of thread. And then the abbot said, Buddha and Christ complement each other. Clearly, this is a kind of koan, a kind of esoteric riddle. The meaning is that we have many parts We have many aspects, each of which has its function and its place. And when united, they harmonize and form a whole. And in that sense, Buddha and Christ are two parts of one perfected thing, which is our own consciousness. And the the abbot of that temple fortunately understood that. He understood that the true dharma, the true religion, is universal. He understood that at the base, every religion is really one religion. And when we find sectarianism, where we find doctrinal dispute, we find misunderstandings. Because in truth, religion is one. Buddha and Christ, in their base are complements of one another. And yet, they are distinct. Of course, in Gnosis, we discuss the Christ in every lecture. The understanding of Christic energy, the Christic force, the Christ who is not an individual, but is rather a vast intelligence or energy, is something that we penetrate into and comprehend and understand according to our own work according to our own development. Likewise with the Buddha. The term Buddha is a title. 
<clears throat> it is a Sanskrit or Pali term, an ancient term, which means awakened one. Now, we typically, in these times, talk about the Buddha, which in the exoteric point of view, the common point of view, refers to one particular person who's also known as Buddha Shakyamuni, or Gautama. But in truth, the name Buddha is a title, in the same way that Christ is a title. Christ is that universal energy at the base of all things, the force that gives life to all existence. But Christ is also a title for any person, any being, who incarnates that energy, who merges and becomes one with that energy who expresses that. So a Buddha is someone who has incarnated his own inner Buddha. In other words, his own inner spirit who is awake. And this refers to, in the Kabbalah, chesed, our own spirit. In reality, there are many different kinds of Buddhas. Because again, the term Buddha means awakened one. And we awaken according to certain levels. The consciousness awakens by degrees, according to our work. So when someone is given the title Buddha, it doesn't mean that they enter into a level in which all Buddhas are the same. The first acquisition of that title, when it's given to the inner spirit, the innermost, is just the first level. And of course, if you've studied Gnosis, you know that this is related to Netzach, the mental body. When an initiate has completed the initiation of Netzach, his innermost is called a Buddha. His innermost, his inner spirit becomes a Buddha. But a Buddha of that level. And from there, that initiate has to continue to work to comprehend the mind more deeply and thereby ascend through different levels of Buddhahood to acquire a greater and greater understanding. So from this point of view, we can grasp and understand that there are actually millions of Buddhas. Really, every star is the expression of a Buddha. Every star in the sky. In terms of Gnosis, just to give a little background to Gnostic students, there's another way to look at Buddha, this term. We have two primary forms or or types of Buddhas that we discuss. There's the contemplation Buddha. And a contemplation Buddha is really what we're talking about when we say Buddha itself, an awakened one, or the spirit. And this refers to what in classical Hinduism would be called Atman, or Chesed. This is the seventh Sephra on the tree of life. This is our inner spirit. Our inner spirit becomes that contemplation Buddha when the acquisition of that initiation occurs. And then we also have a manifestation Buddha, And this is the vehicle through which the contemplation Buddha will express himself. In Mahayana Buddhism, this would be called a bodhisattva. So the manifestation Buddha is the awakened expression of a contemplation Buddha. When we discuss the 
historical Buddha, the Buddha Shakyamuni, we have to bear this distinction in mind. And this is because the historical Buddha, the physical entity, the physical person, was a manifestation Buddha. He was an entity, a creature, a being, who acquired a great deal of insight, who taught the Dharma, the teaching. But he did that as an expression of his own inner contemplation Buddha. His inner being, the, the source of that light that expressed itself through Gautama, through Shakyamuni, is called Amitabha. And if you've, you've studied any Buddhism, you know that Amitabha Buddha is widely worshipped, respected, prayed to, especially in Japanese culture, Chinese culture. Amitabha Buddha is seen as a Buddha of serenity and compassion and as one who has promised to liberate souls who call upon him. So he expressed himself physically into the physical world through his vehicle, through his human soul, through his manifestation Buddha, who was Gautama, the Shakyamuni. So we can relate this to the Gospels, to the Bible, when we look at what Paul wrote about our inner constitution. The contemplation Buddha would be the heavenly man, which Paul mentions. And the manifestation Buddha would be his human soul, the bodhisattva, the terrestrial man. Now, even with this distinction of contemplation and manifestation, there are other important aspects to understand about this term Buddha. To acquire Buddhahood is a matter of personal, in-depth work. But there are stages of that work. There are levels. Just like in life, when we achieve something, we may achieve that on a temporary basis or on a permanent basis. This becomes a particularly tricky thing to to grasp when you understand something about the Buddhist teaching. In other words, we could say that there are those who are permanently or firmly established in the state of Buddhahood and there are those who achieve it transitory, in a transitory way, in a temporary way. This will become clearer to you in the course of the the lecture today. Now, about Buddhas and about Shakyamuni, the Dalai Lama repeatedly points out a very important facet or aspect of the Buddha for us to grasp. And this is that, at one time, the Buddha Shakyamuni was just like us. The Buddha Shakyamuni is not seen as a god or as a deity who's always existed up in heaven. In other words, Buddha was a person, a human being. But because of his observation of the truth of life, the facts of life, he delved deeper and deeper into comprehending that truth. And because of that, he developed a great deal of wisdom. And in in the process of that effort, became an awakened one. In other words, he completely awakened his consciousness and was able to perceive directly the truth. So he became a Buddha. But this is not something given by divine right. Nor is it something that he acquired by belief or by heritage or patrimony or some kind of gift. 
or a boon from the gods. He acquired the state of Buddhahood through work. And that's really the fundamental basis of his teaching. Any person can become a Buddha. Anyone. And the cause, the reason, the source of that is within you. It is what is often called Buddha nature. Buddha nature. In Sanskrit is Tathagatagarbha, or the embryo of the Buddha, the seed of the Buddha. In Zen they call this Buddhata. In, this, in uh, Gnosis we call it the essence. And this is the, the little seed of free consciousness that we have. A seed is small. It needs to be developed. And that seed is not developed with beliefs. It's not developed with gifts or just because or by any natural law like evolution. The Buddha nature only grows and emerges with work because of karma, because of cause and effect. Any Buddha is a child of his own deeds. Any Buddha has grown that Buddha nature into a tree, into wisdom. And this is done through a process of self-inspection, self-reflection, self-analysis. Not in an intellectual way, but by utilizing the Buddha nature itself. So, obviously, the first thing that an aspirant towards Buddhahood has to know, what is the Buddha nature? How does one use it? If you remain in the dark about your own Buddha nature, how to taste that, to experience that, to utilize it, then you are not on the path. It's very simple. In order to enter into the path towards becoming an awakened being, a Buddha, you have to work with that Buddha nature. You have to know what that is. Buddha Shakyamuni summed up his entire teaching in one sentence. He said, I teach about suffering and the way to end it. And this is, in in its essence, the method of working with the Buddha nature. It's to comprehend our own suffering and to end that. So, in the historical record, and in the many traditions that uh, have sprung up in the wake of this awakened being, there are a lot of varieties. There are many variations. It's difficult to pinpoint his precise date of birth or the precise literal aspects of his life story. And part of the reason is nothing was written down for 500 years. 500 years is a long time. For 500 years after his birth and subsequent death, None of his tradition was written. None of it was preserved except through the oral tradition. And that tradition was very dispersed. It branched out all over India and spread all over Asia. And so it had many variations. Because you know how an oral tradition can be. If you tell something to your friend, your friend will tell it to someone else in a little bit different way. And even among disciples of a person like the Buddha, disciples who are working with the consciousness, each will have their own idiosyncrasy, their own level. And so we'll explain that teaching and explain that story in a different way. And gradually, over the period of 500 years, that history, that story, 
and that teaching changed dramatically. In fact, Samael Onvior stated that Gautama, the Buddha, very wisely taught his doctrine, but his doctrine was very much adulterated by his followers. And in fact, you can find in the sutras that the Buddha himself predicted that. In the written sutra, which they started to be written down 500 years after his death, it is recorded there that the Buddha stated within 500 years of his death, his teaching would be unrecognizable. It would be so adulterated. So keep that in mind. As we discuss this teaching today, and as we discuss what is left in his mythology, in his life story, it's just, it's just a symbol. It's just the shadow of what really happened. But just like the other great teachers, such as Jesus, Krishna, Moses, we have a form of a life story. But it's a symbolic story. It's an initiatic story, which has been passed down in order to inform disciples, to teach disciples about the path. So the story of the life of Buddha is not a literal story. It may have elements of his literal life in the same way that the Gospels relate elements of the physical life of Jesus. But they don't tell his actual physical life. They tell an initiatic representation of that life, a teaching story. Nonetheless, historically, it's understood that he was born more or less 500 years before Jesus. So, five to 600 B.C. It's about 2,500 years ago. And he was born in, of course, what is now known as Nepal. His name, Gautama, is his family name. And the term Shakya, from Shakyamuni, is the name of his tribe, his clan. It's an ethnic group who still exists in Nepal. Shakya means lion. Gautama has a certain relationship to cowherd. Of course, in these different traditions, the many different traditions of Buddhism, his life story is related in different ways. Buddhism uh, does not present itself in uh, the same fashion as many of the Western religions, where the Western religions have sort of established um, scripture that they consider to be authoritative. In Buddhism, see, okay, in the Western tradition, for example, in Christianity, we have the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And all the books that are gathered into that collection were agreed upon by scholars and leaders in the preceding centuries. And this is all based on dogmatic and political causes, why they picked the ones that they did. But in Buddhism, there's a huge variety of schools spread all over Asia. And every one of these schools has their own approach to the scripture and has their own scriptures that they believe are more authoritative. And of course, amongst these schools, the scriptures all disagree with each other because they're all derived from that oral tradition. There's very little in terms of written documentation from the very early years. It was only later, gradually over time, that it was more and more written down. So when I relate today the story of the Buddha Shakyamuni, I'm going to relate 
a Tibetan version. But even among the Tibetan versions, there are what you might call disparities or contradictions. But again, I would emphasize for you to remember these are not literal. These stories are told in order to explain the teaching. And this is a distinct difference in Eastern and Western mentalities. There's something in the Western mind that seeks authoritative, authoritative or definitive answer. Where in the Asian mind, they have a different point of view, a different focus. In Asian cultures, it has not been perceived, at least until recently, that it's so important to have a scriptural authority in the sense of a written word. And this is why, for example, in Tibetan history, they never wrote their history down. And when they did, they were very metaphorical, the histories that were written. They weren't a literal history. And this is because that Asian mentality doesn't place so much importance on the literal aspects, but rather on the meaning. Where in the Western mind, it seems to be the opposite. We are more concerned with facts rather than the meaning. In Tibetan culture, of course, the Buddha, Shakyamuni, is a key figure. And really is the, the base figure upon which their entire culture is based. Strongly based. Not entirely, but strongly based. His life story is traditionally taught and represented in a series of 12 steps. And this is called different, uh, different things. But you could say it's the 12 great deeds, the great, 12 great works of the Buddha. So you might see uh, Tibetan paintings or tankas, which represent the stages of the life of Buddha. And it will have 12 primary um, points of focus. Now, if you've been paying attention to this series of lectures, you will remember in the series on the arcana of the tarot that 12 is a very significant number. The arcanum 12 is related to the apostle, the apostolate. And this is a very interesting thing to recognize, that the life of the Buddha would be related in Tibetan tradition in a way that's totally correspondent to a Western law, or a, a law that's codified in this tradition that's often called Western, which is the Tarot. Of course, in Gnosis, we know that this tradition is universal. When we look at these 12 steps, it's very important to keep in mind the arcana of the Tarot, and I'll mention them from time to time. But I invite you to study this, to study the arcana of the Tarot in relationship to the stages of the Buddha's initiatic life. So there's a direct relation. Step one of the Buddha's initiatic life is his promise. It's related in the Tibetan traditions that the Buddha Shakyamuni, before he received that title, was known by another name, Shvetaketu. And that's spelled S-H-V-E-T-A-K-E-T-U. And that he was a great and enlightened master who was teaching in the heavens, in the superior worlds, teaching the Dharma, to the gods. And he had achieved this level through countless previous existences. 
And some of those stories of his previous existences are collected in a book or a collection of tales called the Jataka Tales. And the Jataka Tales are a huge collection of the life stories of the Buddha Shakyamuni. So Buddha Shakyamuni, or Shvetaketu, was teaching in the Tushita heaven. And this is a realm of nirvana a superior level of existence populated by gods, or in other words, beings who had already achieved a certain degree of understanding. And so he was there teaching them. But he became reminded or aware of his promise to return once again to the physical world in order to teach human beings. And he had promised to do this at the time when it was most ripe, when at the time when it was most needed. When he looked down on this physical world, he saw the suffering of humanity. And he considered whether it was time. The gods encouraged him and said, it's important for you to go teach the Dharma. And they said, the world is in ruin because of the six dialecticians, the six followers, and the six meditators. In other words, the world is in ruin because of six, six, six. If you've studied Christianity, you know the significance of this number. But let's go deeper. The gods told him, the world is in ruin because of six dialecticians. What is a dialectician? It's someone who utilizes a dialectic. Intellect. Reasoning. In other words, what the Bible calls scribes. The world is in ruin because of six intellectuals. The number six and intellectuals. The world is in ruin because of six believers. In other words, what the Bible calls Pharisees. And the world is in ruin because of six meditators. In case you don't recall, in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist, the great dragon, the the cause of suffering, is identified as having the value of 666. In Gnosis, we of course study very deeply Kabbalistic numerology. And the number six figures significantly in the life of the Buddha and also in the Bible. The Arcanum Six is the Arcanum Indecision, which represents in its image an initiate standing between two women, a virgin and a whore. In other words, two aspects of the Divine Mother. Two aspects of Maya. The human being is given the value, or the intellectual animal, the person like us, is given the value of 666 because we are undefined we stand in between the virgin and the whore, psychologically speaking. In other words, we're trapped in the midst of illusion and have the necessity of choosing the virgin or the whore. 
Truth or illusion? Desire or liberation? So when the gods tell the Buddha that the world is in ruin because of the 666, they're saying the world is in ruin because of the ego. And how the ego utilizes the intellect through being dialectician, through being too intellectual, through the heart, by being a fanatic, by being a mere believer without any real experience of the truth, or by being what they call a meditator, what you could also call a fakir, someone who does a lot of practices, who's very adamant about their own tradition and their own religion, but is fanatic and is attached. In each of these examples, what we're seeing is a fundamental aspect of Gnostic psychology, which indicates that we all have a kind of psychological predisposition related to one of these three brains. Some of us are more intellectual by nature, some of us are more emotional, and some of us are more instinctive. The gods told Buddha, the world is in ruin because of these three types of people. In the Bible, this is called the Tower of Babel. These are the three inferior types of people. The Buddha recognized this and made the decision to manifest, to consciously incarnate. In other words, the contemplation Buddha, the inner master, the inner spirit, chose the time, date, place, and circumstances of his birth and projected himself into nature in order to help humanity. So we arrive then at step number two. This is Queen Maya's dream, is the way it's often called. The contemplation Buddha had chosen to be born to a royal couple. And this, again, is in a region which nowadays is known as Nepal, near the Himalaya. To be born in the clan of the Shakya. And the mother that was chosen was named Maya. She's often called Maha Maya or Maya Devi. This word, Maya, is just the name of the goddess. Any goddess in Hinduism is Maya. The story goes that during the time of the month when Maya was in her monthly purification retreat, in other words, having her menstrual cycle, she had a dream. And in this dream a great white elephant came from heaven and entered into her womb. The elephant is a symbol of the innermost, the being, the contemplation Buddha. She was dreaming during that period of the month, which traditionally, according to Asian ethic, is a time when the woman and the man, the husband and wife, suspend their sexual relations. And it's also stated in the tradition that the king and queen did not have a child. In other words, Maya was virgin. Here we have an immaculate conception where the elephant, the contemplation Buddha, enters into the womb of this virginal queen. Symbolically, a king or a queen 
would be a malachim, someone who had awakened consciousness, an initiate. And as someone who understood the doctrine and was practicing the teaching, she, Maya, the queen, the mother, represents the divine mother, the goddess, Maya, from whose womb emerges the Savior, in the same way that we see in the Christian tradition. This title of Maya literally means appearance. The way it's typically translated, though, is as illusion. And Western scholars have somewhat misconstrued the meaning of this word Maya as being something that's always negative, where it's not. Maya is the name of the Divine Mother. But the Divine Mother has many aspects. When we look back to this Arcanum 6, we see two women on either side of the initiate. Really, these are two aspects of the Divine Mother. The pure and the impure. We have the pure Divine Mother who is the truth. Who is virgin. And then we have the Divine Mother who within whose arms rests humanity, which is defiled. She still loves them, but she is a defiled mother. She is impure. Normally, when Western scholars discuss Maya, they're discussing the impure mother, the mother of illusion, deception, deceit. But be clear in your understanding of the word Maya. It does not always mean that. The term Maya is is actually a title for the wife of Shiva, who is also known as Shakti. Shiva could not exist without Maya, without his spouse. And this combination of male-female, Shiva-Shakti, is the basis of existence. It's also interesting to note the word Maya is also the name of an entire population in Latin America. And they also worship the goddess. So in the second stage, Maya becomes pregnant. In the third She gives birth. Now, to step back for one moment, if you remember, if you look at the arcana of the tarot, the second and third both represent aspects of the Divine Mother. Number two and three. In the third, of course, the third arcanum, this is the arcanum related to how the Divine Mother manifests, produces, creates. And the number three is the law of creation. And of course, in the third stage of the Buddha's life, the Buddha manifests. The Buddha is actually born. The story goes that while pregnant, Mahamaya wanted to go for a walk. So she, with her entourage, went into the Lumbini Gardens and took a stroll. But as she approached a tree, she felt at that moment that she was going to give birth. And in order to steady herself, she reached up with her right hand and grabbed the tree. And at that moment, the Buddha emerged from her right side. She gave birth through her side. This is, of course, a Kabbalistic symbol 
Firstly, because she grabs a hold of the tree, the tree of life. She grasps that to give her her foundation with her right hand, which symbolizes present action, right action. And from her right side emerges this child, the Buddha. And this, of course, relates very well to Adam and Eve. As you recall, Eve is pulled from the right side, the rib of Adam. And this is symbolic of how the soul unfolds and manifests. How the tree of life unfolds itself in levels in order to create existence. Now, at present at this birth were many of the Hindu gods, Indra, Brahma, and many others. So if you see paintings of the moment of birth, you'll see gods there assisting, receiving the child, bathing the child, holding parasols, and assisting in general, the whole process. What's important about that is that in Asian or Hindu tradition, they very much believe in cleanliness and a birth because there's blood and fluid accompanying a birth, a typical birth, it's said to be an unclean event. And and Gnosis, we understand that because the typical birth is really a result of fornication. So it is not an immaculate birth. But in the case of the Buddha, just like Jesus, this was a birth that was clean, and that's why the gods were there. The gods were assisting, represented in the story, because of the cleanliness of the event, because it happened without fornication. In other words, it was an event of chastity. Now, of course, at this moment, there were many miracles that happened in the region. And because of all the miracles, there was a great rain, which ended uh, some troubles for the local people. And there were many other births in the region, many children, many animals were born. His father named him Siddhartha. And Siddhartha means accomplisher of aims. Someone who accomplishes what they set out to do. Now, you know, of course, that there are many great masters who are born of immaculate births. We have Buddha, we have Jupiter, Zeus, Apollo, Quetzalcoatl, Fuji, Lao Tse, Jesus, all born of virgins, all born of an immaculate conception. And their mothers were virgin. Virgin before, during, and after the childbirth. When the child is born, some sages, some educated priests, analyze the child and discover that this child has all of the esoteric symbols or signs in his physical constitution that demonstrate that he is a Buddha. There are many such symbolic signs. But the Master Samael stated that whoever studies the 32 capital signs of Buddha him, biologically, Buddhahood, will reach the conclusion that these sexual characteristics, secondary sexual characteristics, are symbols of someone who is a superman, someone who's beyond a normal human being. And that these kind of characteristics only come because of intense transmutation. The fourth stage is his youth. And as a youth, he was, uh, of course, a little bit of a strange child. Now, it's stated that shortly after his birth, either right after or seven days after, his mother died. 
But this is also symbolic. This is a symbolic gesture indicating that her work was complete. This is a mystical death. She was, and, and in turn, the child was raised by her sister and nursemaids. And of course, as the child of a king, he was given all the best. Riches, luxury, protection, education. He became an expert in astrology and literature and all the sciences. And there are many stories about his childhood which, were, uh, which demonstrate his supernatural powers, his supernatural abilities. The fifth stage is his skillful uh, conduct or his worldly development. It's at this stage that as a young man, about 16, it was time for him to marry. And when he came of age, he had to prove himself. There was, in some versions of the story, it said that there was a lot of doubt about him because he was raised with such a luxurious lifestyle that there was, any, there was a lot of doubt whether he could be a warrior or a leader or a ruler because he was so isolated. So there were not a lot of offers for other royal um, families to offer their daughters for him to take a wife. Nonetheless, through, you'll see different stories about this time when he does great feats in order to demonstrate his abilities. Probably the most famous is an archery contest in which he demonstrates a tremendous skill with a bow and by that shows the people that he is a warrior and has the capacity to lead and rule. So he wins his wife, Yashoda. She's his cousin. And they have a child. The child's name is Rahula. It's interesting that the child, the name of the child means chain or bondage. And this is often taken as a symbol of the burden of material life. That when you produce works in your material life, a child, in other words, symbolic, that these material works become burdensome to the spiritual aspirant. And a child, in this sense, can represent projects, businesses, any kind of worldly pursuit. So you may have a dream about a child, and that child could represent a worldly project, something materialistic, which can become a burden for you. The Buddha also had a, another relative who is mentioned in this stage of his life, whose name is Mahavira. Mahavira is usually said to be a cousin, but sometimes a brother. Mahavira was a competitor. Someone who was jealous or envious. I'm sorry, not Mahavira. I got the name wrong. <laughs> There's so many names here. Scratch that. Yeah. Devadatta is the cousin, the brother. Mahavira, on the other hand, was a contemporary of Buddha. Just, just because I mentioned it, let me explain about Mahavira. 
Contemporaneous to the Buddha Shakyamuni is this historical person called Mahavira. Mahavira is widely recognized as one of the important founders of the Jain religion. And if you look at the Jain tradition, it's strikingly similar to Buddhism. So scholars nowadays have theorized that perhaps Gautama and Mahavira studied together, maybe had the same teacher. M-A-H-A-V-I-R-A. But the Master Samael indicated that Mahavira was to Buddha the way John the Baptist was to Jesus, his precursor, his, his, uh, the person who came to announce him, to prepare the way. Both of them were um, princes of the, the tribes. And both revolted against the established priesthood, the Hindu or Brahmanic tradition. So there are a lot of interesting similarities between the two. The sixth stage of the Buddha's life is called the Four Encounters. Now, as a, as a young prince... The Buddha was isolated. He was isolated because at his birth, a prediction was made that this miraculous child would become one of two things. Either the greatest king that the earth had ever known or the greatest saint. So, of course, the father was overjoyed but didn't want his son to be a saint. He wanted him to be a king like him. So he isolated his son. He kept Gautama within the palace grounds and never allowed him to see suffering, illness, old age, or death. So as a young man, the Buddha Gautama never saw these things. And he was continuing on as a typical person until he was 29. Of course, at this point, the gods who had encouraged him to take birth, to teach the Dharma, to help suffering beings, had no choice but to intervene. One day, the Gautama went for a ride with his charioteer. He got permission to go and tour the city. And the king in advance had cleared out all the old people, all the sick people, all the dying people, all the suffering people. So everybody that was left was not old and was young and happy. So the Gautama began his tour of the city in this context. But the devas, the gods, intervened and showed themselves to Gautama as the sick, the old, the infirm, the dying. And Gautama was thunderstruck, shocked by this first recognition that life is suffering. And he stated, it's recorded in the tradition, What is the use of youth, which is ultimately destroyed by age? What is the benefit of health, which will end only with illness? What is the good of wisdom in life if this life lasts not forever? Aging, sickness, and death follow each other inevitably. The Arcanum 8, which if we relate it to this 8th stage, wait a minute, these numbers are wrong. No, I'm talking about the 6th, sorry, 6th. 
the number six, of course, we've discussed indecision. Gautama in this portion of the story represents, of course, us. Whether or not we realize it, we are, in a way, kings and queens, privileged people in this sense, because we have a physical body. We have the privilege of having a relative degree of health. We have the privilege of having access to the Dharma. We have many privileges. We have the possibilities to take advantage of life and to use it well. So we are like that prince who had lived in ignorance, enjoying all of his luxuries without care. And really, we are like that. Fortunately, the gods intervene. And the gods will show us the truth of life. When one of our loved ones dies, when someone near us gets very sick, when we lose a child or a loved one, the way we usually take these events is with a great deal of self-pity. We need to learn to emulate the example of the Buddha. To take these events as a stimulus for wisdom. As an opportunity to comprehend something about the nature of existence. To not waste it. When the Buddha observed the suffering of humanity, it arose in him the profound understanding of the futility of terrestrial life, materialistic life, the typical life. And accompanied with that was a sense of renunciation. This is the sixth event, which relates to this sixth arcanum, which is the moment in which we have to choose. Do we remain attracted and identified with the illusions of the horror, maya, all the materialistic pleasures of life, all of our passions, all of our lust? Or do we renounce that to find the truth maya, the goddess, the dharma, our own wisdom mind? Naturally, in the story of the Buddha, he chooses to renounce the maya of illusion, the maya of possessions, of luxury, of passion. So then we go to the seventh stage, which is that renunciation. Having perceived this, aspect of life, that life leads to death, life leads to illness, life leads to suffering. He's convinced that there must be a way to overcome that. He sees a holy person, a monk, a renunciate, and decides to take that example. So he abandons his life, his physical life, his materialistic life. He rejects his heritage, his inheritance, his materialistic ties. And he goes out into the wilderness in order to meditate. This event is usually symbolized by the Buddha cutting off his hair. And this event is honored by all the monks and nuns of his uh, traditions who shave their heads. The cutting of the hair is symbolic of cutting 
ties to materialism. Of course, as a young prince, as a king in training, he had long hair fitted with jewels. He wore a very, very um, princely royal robe and had all kinds of jewelry and fine things. And he cast all of that off. When he cut his hair, he's usually symbolized as taking that lock and throwing it up into the sky. And the gods take it. And this is a symbol of the renunciation to give up everything to God. And this relates well to what Jesus told the disciples. To not put your heart into materialistic treasures, but to invest yourself in treasures in heaven. Because those are the only ones that will remain permanent. So the Buddha renounces and he enters into stage eight, which is the period of austerity. Naturally, we need to refer, of course, to the arcana. The seventh arcana is triumph, which is the chariot in which the innermost, the contemplation Buddha, commands his vehicle. So in stage number seven, when Gautama renounces the world, he throws his hair up to heaven. He takes on that challenge to fulfill the duty of his own contemplation Buddha, which is to teach the Dharma. In other words, he fulfills the Arcanum Seven to become that chariot, the vehicle through which the contemplation Buddha can express himself. In the eighth arcana, the arcanum number eight, this is the arcanum of Job, the arcanum of suffering. This is the arcanum of justice. And this is the time of great difficulty. In this period of his life, he becomes a a very extreme renunciate. Not only does he renounce his luxurious lifestyle, he renounces food. It's said in the tradition that he survives on a single grain of rice each day. And all he does is meditate. That's all. 24 hours a day for six years. This is extremely significant. In order to become a Buddha, you have to work. The Dalai Lama, when talking about the life of the Buddha, mentioned that when he considers the life of the Buddha, he feels a certain kind of, I think the word he used was anxiety, a little bit anxious. And it's because of this six-year period. The Dalai Lama said that he doesn't feel that people really understand what that period of time means. You don't become a Buddha just by believing in the teaching. You don't become a Buddha by sitting around and enjoying a luxurious lifestyle. The Buddha was not watching television. He was not playing games. He was not enjoying any kind of luxurious lifestyle. He was sitting and meditating for six years with extreme renunciation, not even caring for his body. He became so thin that his bones stuck out. Pushing in his stomach, he could touch his spine. All his hair fell out. His skin withered. 
And so you'll see images of the Buddha who looks like a skeleton draped with skin. And this is a symbol of his willpower. How much willpower it takes to reach the goal. What he realized, however, was when in the process of these extreme ascetic practices, he realized that his mind was still craving. As much as he could deny his mind its desires, it still craved. And there are different stories that relate the moment in which he made a profound realization. In one, the gods come to tell him, to help him, to explain to him. But the one that is probably most known is while seated in meditation, he was near a stream, a river. And coming down the stream was a small boat. And on the boat was a musician. And the musician was playing an instrument called a vina. Vina is a stringed instrument like a guitar or a lute. And this musician was plucking the strings. And when the Buddha, Shakyamuni, observed this musician, he comprehended that if the string is too loose, it won't make a note. And if the string is too tight, it will break. It has to be exactly the right level of tightness in order to have the right note and to play and sound beautifully. And in that instant, he realized that he was on the wrong path. That his austerities were too extreme. And he needed to care for his physical body so that it could be a vehicle for his enlightenment, for his realization. Now, this is a very critical stage. It, what it demonstrates and, and as he taught it was, you have to take the middle way. Not to be a victim of the two extremes. And this applies to almost everything in life. He had lived his early life with extreme luxury. And when he renounced that, he went all the way to the other side of the swing of a pendulum into extreme austerity. And what he recognized and demonstrated in his life is that both are harmful. In order to be balanced, you have to stand in the middle to have equilibrium between these extremes. And so in that moment, a woman appears. I love this part of the story. A woman appears to give him milk. The milk of a thousand cows. And he takes the milk and drinks it and restores his health and glows with health and beauty. You may remember from other lectures that the cow is sacred as a symbol of the Divine Mother. And the milk of the cow symbolizes amrita, soma, ambrosia, the wine of the alchemist, the transmuted waters of life. You may recall the story of how the gods and demons churn the great phallic rod in the ocean of existence by using a serpent. And as they churn that, the waters, the soma, is churned up, the great oceans of life, the prakriti. And from that emerge many sacred elements. Of course, that story represents the process of alchemical transmutation, which occurs within the psyche and physiology of an initiate who's working in chastity. One of the items that arises from that sacred water is a cow. The name of that cow is Kamadenu, which means the wish-fulfilling cow. But Kama means love. 
It can also mean desire. It can also relate to action. But this wish-fulfilling cow gives forth the nectar of immortality, the amrita. And this is a woman. So lo and behold, in the life of Buddha, a woman appears to give him the nectar of immortality. And who else is that? But his spouse. His divine mother, working through his tantric relationship, his alchemical relationship. Having comprehended the essential need to balance between the two extremes, he takes advantage of these sacred waters and passes into the next stage, number nine. He gets up from this place where he had been sitting in in number eight and advances to the Bodhi tree. The term Bodhi, of course, as you know, means wisdom. It also means awakened. But it also means knowledge. How interesting is it that after the Buddha receives the divine Amrita, the water of immortality, from the woman, he goes to the tree of knowledge. And he sits to meditate. The image is usually that he sits with his back to the tree. In Kabbalah, we know that the tree of life is the spinal column. The Buddha sits against that tree, which rises up along his spinal column. But do you know what kind of tree it is? It's a kind of a ficus, a fig tree. In the Bible, the fig tree is very important. Jesus approaches the fig tree in the gospel and sees that it has no fruit. And he condemns the tree and it withers and dies. The fig tree is related to sexuality, but specifically to feminine sexual forces, the forces of Neshima, the forces of Budi, Gebra, our divine consciousness. When the Buddha Shakyamuni sits at the Bodhi tree, the tree of wisdom, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, his own spinal column. He's harnessing the forces of the Amrita, the milk, and transmuting those forces to enliven that fig tree so that it will give fruit. And this is stage nine. The Buddha stays in meditation at the base of this tree for 49 days. Why? Why 49? Forty-nine days in the Eastern traditions is symbolic. When someone dies, there is always a period of mourning for 49 days. A period of observance, a period of remembrance, a period of prayer. To honor that person and to assist them as they move on to their new life. When the Buddha Shakyamuni sits for 49 days at the base of the tree, he is approaching death, psychological death, the death of the mind, the full and complete and total death of everything that is subjective and illusory within himself. In other words, he will take 
the waters of the Amrita, that milk, and transform that into fire and light the 49 fires of the mind. And these 49 fires are related to the seven bodies and the seven chakras in each body. It's said that after four weeks of meditating at the Bodhi tree, he was so concentrated, so focused, he didn't realize or didn't care that a great storm was brewing around him. And a flood began to creep up around him. So his life was in danger. But a great king of the elemental kingdom came to assist the Buddha. This king is named Mukalinda. And he is a Naga king. Naga is a serpent. And in the, in the East, in Asia, it is known that there is a race of beings called the Nagas. Nagas are usually related to elemental forces which protect bodies of water, like rivers, lakes, streams. And it's well known that any person who approaches a lake or a stream or a pond should always treat it with respect. Otherwise, the Nagas will take revenge. As an example, if, you, if a person goes to any pond or lake or stream to relieve themselves of urine or any other bodily fluid or function, they will become sick. And it's because the Nagas want to teach that person to respect the water, to not pollute the water. This is a folk tradition in India and in the other Asian countries around there. So Mukalinda recognizes that the Buddha is in danger. And Mukalinda manifests himself in his serpent form and raises, he coils himself under the Buddha and raises the Buddha up above the rising floodwaters at the base of the tree. And Mukalinda also raises himself over the Buddha and manifests himself with seven heads to act as a shield or an umbrella to protect Buddha from the rain. You know, of course, that the flood is very important in the Greek mysteries because the gods send a flood to destroy the impure humanity. And the flood is also very important in the Babylonian Sumerian mysteries because of the same reason. And the flood is important in the Jewish tradition because of the same reason. And likewise in the Christian. The flood comes as a process of the death of the I. The flood are those waters of passion, the sexual waters, which rise up because of transmutation. And those waters are churned and are in activity because of all the energy, because of all the karma of that initiate. Many drown because they become identified with their own passions, their own karma, their own idiocies, and they fail. But the Buddha, remaining in meditation, receives the assistance of the elemental forces, Mukalinda, who in this context is representing the Divine Mother Kundalini, which is coiled three and a half times at the base of the spine in the Muladhara Chakra. By working with a spouse, the initiate awakens that sacred fire, and the serpent begins to rise up the spine in order to shield the initiate and protect him from his karma. 
So the serpent in the story comes up with seven heads. This is why the Buddha stated, Listen to me well, gods and humans, for which in, within each Buddha are seven Buddhas. And these seven are the seven bodies of the soul. The seven bodies which make up the physiology of the vehicle through which the Buddha can express. We're not using the term soul in the traditional term, which Buddhism refutes. This is a different term, more like body. Those seven serpent heads represent how the Kundalini must be raised in all of these seven aspects of the physiology and psychology. And when those seven are raised, the serpent of the Kundalini is raised upon the spine seven times. Then the 49 fires are lit. The 49 days are complete. And that serpent, with its seven heads, shields the initiate from the rain. The rain is a symbol of karma, of pain. After this happens, the storm the karmic ordeal, because a storm represents an ordeal, challenges, sufferings, difficulties, the storm passes. And then Mara appears. Mara is a Sanskrit word or Pali word which means destruction. It can also mean murder. It's interesting because in the Hebrew tradition, Mara also means something very negative. It means something like um, mourning, something like that. Bitterness. Bitterness is what it is, right? Mara comes to taunt the Buddha, to make fun of him to question the Buddha's actions in the same way that Lucifer tempts Jesus in the wilderness, tempting him with powers, tempting him to show himself, tempting him with wealth. So Mara is, in other words, the dragon of darkness, Lucifer, the tempter. Mara is part of the Buddha. Mara represents our own mind, all of the egotistical desires within our own mind, which always tempt us away from the right path, from right action. Of course, when the Buddha is so focused on his meditation and on transforming those waters into the pure Amrita, this threatens Mara's power. Mara has the power to utilize desire and sensation in order to hypnotize humanity. So Mara tries many things. He sends his armies of demons against the Buddha. When they fire their weapons, the arrows approach the Buddha and are transformed into flowers. And when they throw their magical spells against the Buddha and fire and water and wind, they're all transformed into flowers and beautiful fragrances. Why? In Gnosis, we call this the transformation of impressions. This is the capacity that an initiate has to cultivate, to develop, through meditation, through self-observation, through self-remembering, by being awake, by paying attention, by learning how to utilize the consciousness, the Buddha nature, to perceive the inherent truth of any given phenomenon. In other words, when the demons, the ego, the karma throws painful elements, the arrows, the fire, the wind, the ordeals of life, criticism, blame, poverty, suffering, wealth. The initiate has to learn how to transform that consciously to take those harmful elements and comprehend them. This is a work of conscious attention, comprehension, 
cannot be faked. It cannot be emulated. It cannot be mimicked. You either do it or you don't. The Buddha in this story, in this symbol, is showing how we have to develop this capacity to receive all the impressions of life with a receptive mind which can penetrate the essential truth of any given thing. For example, if someone criticizes us, we have to learn to see that those words have no value. If someone is gossiping about us, we have to see that those words have no value. This requires meditation because our ego, our mind, cannot do it. Our ego, our mind, is Mara, is the demons of Mara. The Buddha nature has the essential faculty to transform impressions. And we have to grow that. When uh, the demons and all the attacks are failing, Mara sends his three beautiful daughters to tempt the Buddha. These three daughters in the Buddhist tradition are assigned many different meanings. And sometimes there are also three sons. The basic meaning is the same. These are the three furies of the Greek mythology. The three traitors of Osiris. The three traitors of Hiram Abif. The three traitors of Moses. Of Job. The three traitors of Jesus. The three traitors of Caesar. The three traitors that Dante sees in the ninth level of hell. The ninth circle. Of course, these three Maras, these three daughters do what they can to tempt the Buddha. Sometimes they are called the three times, past, present, and future. Sometimes they're called desire, fulfillment, and regret. But in synthesis, we can relate them to our three brains. Intellect, emotion, motor, instinctive, sexual. Because it's through these three that we ourselves are tempted by our own desires. We're tempted by reasoning, we're tempted by emotion, and we are tempted by sensation. Of course, the Buddha remains firm in his meditation, controlling his awareness, and he conquers the three daughters of Mara. At this point, Mara taunts him once more and says, what gives you the right? How is it that you have the the audacity, the pride to think that you can overcome me? And the Buddha says, listen well. I have not done this only now. I'm at this moment because I've been working for this moment for uncounted ages in all my lives. This is not something that occurs spontaneously. And Mara says, who do you have as a witness of that? You could be lying to me. And the Buddha, very serenely, points to the earth and touches the earth with his finger. So you might see that artwork from time to time. Emerging out of the earth comes the goddess, the Divine Mother. And she says, I give witness of his truth. So Mara has no choice but to withdraw conquered. This symbolizes that the Buddha has his foundation in the Divine Mother. In that primordial wisdom which gives rise to all existence. This is something that has to be understood in meditation. So at this moment, he proceeds in his meditation and understands a few things. We move now to the tenth stage. Through the course of this final night, the Buddha goes through four essential stages. 
First, through all the levels of samadhi. Second, he, re- he recollects all of his previous existences. Third, he implements the end of all his afflictive emotions. In other words, the ego is 100% dead. And fourth, he profoundly comprehends the cycle of life and death, which are symbolized in the 12 nidanas, pratitya samutpara, which is here on the wheel of life, these 12 stages around the outer ring. At this moment is when he really earns the title Shakyamuni. As I mentioned, Shakya means lion. The term Shakyamuni means the silent lion. Now this relates well to our lecture on Leo. When we discussed how the astrological sign of Leo is the sun of the zodiac and is that force which directly influences the development of our own heart and mind. And that is the basis of the Buddha doctrine, the Buddha Dharma. It is the lion's roar. At this point, the Buddha, having realized these profound truths, feels that there's no one who could understand it. So he decides not to teach. And all the gods are astonished. Because that was his purpose. To reach liberation in order to teach suffering humanity. And having reached it, he decides not to. So all the gods are in an uproar. Begging him to teach. And they all approach him and entreat him to fulfill his vow to teach humanity. And he refuses. Again and again, he refuses to teach. Keep in mind that we are in the tenth stage, the number ten, the Arcanum Ten. And the Arcanum Ten is the wheel of the Tarot. This wheel represents the evolving and devolving cycles of nature. It is the vehicle of karma. The Buddha refuses to teach because it's karma. However, Brahma comes to him and says, you must teach. Brahma, in Hinduism, is the father. In other words, the being of the Buddha Shakyamuni tells him to teach. He does not until he's told to do it. This is a very significant aspect of this myth. Because in these times, how many people do we see going out and showing themselves as teachers who have not been told to do so? Who may have read a few books, gone to a few retreats, had a few visions, and now proclaim themselves as masters, as Buddhas, and try to gather followers, and try to establish a doctrine. But this great teacher, one of the two greatest teachers in the history of humanity, refused to teach until he was told by his own father to do so. Having received that command, he proceeds. He goes out and first approaches five um, ascetics who he had practiced with during his period of austerity. And he teaches the first teaching of Buddhism, what's called the first turning of the wheel. Remember, we're in the tenth stage, which relates to the tenth arcanum, the wheel of life. 
So in Buddhism, they call his first teaching the first turning of the wheel of Dharma. And you'll see a wheel with eight spokes. Those eight spokes represent the eightfold path. Because the first teaching that the Buddha gives is about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Over the course of his time of teaching, the Buddha taught many levels of instruction. This is where you will start to find um, a lot of variety in the way Buddhism is taught and understood in humanity now. Because there are many levels of his teaching. And of course... Each group claims to have the true transmission. Each group claims to be the only authority. Each group claims their own sutras or tantras to be the only true ones. This is a mistake. Religion is universal. Buddha Dharma is universal. And the teachings are given according to the psychology of the student. We see then that the Buddha's teaching is organized into three primary groups. The first, and perhaps most common, has typically been called Hinayana. But that term's a little bit derogatory because it means the lesser vehicle or the inferior vehicle. Yana means vehicle. Another term, probably more polite, is Taravada. And this, this branch of Buddhism is a sutra system, in other words, based on his public discourses, and is very widespread in Southeast Asia. has many, many different schools. The second vehicle is called the Mahayana, which means the greater vehicle. This one's widespread all over Asia, China, Japan, India. The third is Vajrayana, or diamond vehicle. It's also called Tantrayana. So these are the three basic groups of the Buddha's teachings which are present in these times, physically. And these are more or less arranged by levels of complexity and depth. I'm sure there are practitioners of these traditions who might contradict my statement. In synthesis, they share some fundamental aspects which are important for us to grasp. The Buddha taught that existence has three characteristics, what are also called Dharma seals. The word Dharma has a whole variety of meanings. It can mean truth, law, uh, phenomena, These three seals, or Dharma seals, form the basis of the entire teaching. The first, in the Pali language, is called Dukkha. It's also in Sanskrit, it's the same word, Dukkha. D-U-K-H-A. It can be spelled different ways. This term basically means unsatisfactoriness. Sometimes it's translated as suffering. What this means is that nothing in the psychological world can bring satisfaction. No manifested thing can satisfy craving. The second is called anika or anitya, A-N-I-T-Y-A. And this means impermanence. And in this statement, this seal says that all existing conditioned things are impermanent. They rise and fall. They're born, they sustain, and they die. Everything in conditioned existence is subject to the law of impermanence. The third Dharma seal is anatta. 
in Pali, or in Sanskrit, anatman. And this term you see has atman with the prefix an. And this means no self. This aspect of the teaching says there is no self or uh, independently existing self. These three Dharma seals are condensed in this statement by the Buddha. Whatever is impermanent is subject to change. Whatever is subject to change is subject to suffering. And it's this comprehensive understanding that provides the basis of real religion. The need for meditation is found when you understand the nature of these three seals. To really comprehend them, you must meditate. The intellect cannot grasp the true meaning of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, or no self. Only through meditation can you experience these things. Can you actually taste them and know what they mean? But from the basis of these three Dharma seals, all the traditions of Buddhism emerge. What, what the Buddha teach or taught is that if all compounded things are in their essence lacking the capacity to satisfy, they are all impermanent. And further, we have no independently existing self. Then all things are suffering. And how do we move beyond that? How do we transcend that? With the Buddha nature. With the Buddha Dharma. By growing that seed of the Buddha nature into the tree of wisdom, the Bodhi tree. From these three Dharma seals emerge the four noble truths. The first one says that birth is suffering, aging is suffering, Illness is suffering. Death is suffering. Union with what is displeasing is suffering. Separation from what is pleasing is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. In brief, the five aggregates, aggregates subject to clinging are suffering. Then there's the cause of suffering, which is the second truth. It is this craving which, relieves, which leads to renewed existence accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there, craving for sensual pleasure, craving for existence, craving for extermination. The third truth says, it is the remainder this is not translated right. The third truth says that there is an end to suffering. And the fourth truth says, the way to end suffering is the Eightfold Path. This Eightfold Path has eight steps. Right view, or understanding. Right intention, or motivation. Right speech, or communication. Right action, or conduct. Right vocation, or livelihood. Right effort. Right attention, or mindfulness. And right presence, or concentration. These eight aspects are fundamental to any real religion. These are the basis of Gnosis. They are the basis of Christianity. These eight have their esoteric aspect, which were taught by Samael on Vior. The first is creative comprehension, where the Buddha says right view Samael states, creative comprehension. Where the Buddha says, right intention, Samael says, upright intentions, the same. Where the Buddha says, right speech, Samael says, upright words, right speech. Where the Buddha says, right action, Samael says, absolute sacrifice. 
where the Buddha says, right vocation or livelihood, the Samael says, upright behavior. And where the Buddha says, right effort, Samael says, chastity. Where the Buddha says, right attention or mindfulness, Samael says, constant struggle against the black magicians. And number eight, where the Buddha says, right presence, Samael says, supreme patience. These eight steps form the basis for the psychological work that is necessary to grow the Buddha nature into a full Buddha. These are self-imposed, self-understood, self-activated, realized through your own action, realized through your own comprehension. In order to understand what right view is, or right action is, you have to understand that in yourself. Reading a book will not tell you. Listening to a lecture will not tell you. To know how to act right in a given situation, you have to meditate. You have to activate the consciousness. When the consciousness becomes active and can observe the phenomena of that situation, it can penetrate into the two extremes the extremes of how the ego works through the pendulum, through desire, through craving and aversion. And by comprehending the nature of those extremes, your consciousness can then determine what is the right action to perform. The Buddha taught these profound truths in many levels, according to the needs of the students. At this point, we move to stage 11 of the Buddha's life. This is where we see the Buddha ascending into the triatrimsa heaven. This, this name literally means the 33. And of course, 33 is very significant in esoteric studies. This is related to the 33rd vertebra on the spinal column. The 33, 33 years of Jesus, the 33, 33 degrees of the Masons. In this moment, the Buddha decides to go and visit his mother who is in this 33rd heaven. And when he arrives there, usually you'll see the Buddha in these, uh, in paintings of this moment, seated Western style, like the Maitreya. So he goes there to visit his mother, which is symbolic, of course, of his initiatic process. And the beings of earth beg him to come back. And he's depicted coming back on a ladder. Of course, this ladder relates well to Egyptian mysteries, which state that there is a ladder to heaven. And of course, to the ladder of Jacob in the Bible, in which there is a ladder to heaven. That same ladder is in Dante's Inferno. And that ladder goes up and down the back of Lucifer, the spinal column. In other words, the Buddha ascends and descends up and down the spine to go to heaven and back. And this is the 11th symbol. What's interesting is, in the 11th arcanum, we have an image of the Divine Mother holding open the mouth of a lion. The card is called Temperance. Buddha is the lion of the Shakya clan. The lion has many symbols. It's a lion of the law. 
can represent a master. The lion can also represent our animal passion. But in this 11th stage of the Buddha's life, he ascends up to heaven on the 33 rungs of this ladder to the 33rd heaven to visit his mother. She is the one who's providing him the temperance, the strength to give his lion's roar, the Buddha Dharma. So he goes back and we enter into the 12th stage. The 12th stage of the Buddha's life is called the passage into Parinirvana. And then this is where you see symbolized his death. This is the final nirvana or the highest level of nirvana is what Parinirvana means. This symbolizes the, the moment towards the end of his long physical life when he leaves his physical body. And naturally, in the initiatic process, this is a necessary stage for the, the initiate to advance. Now, what's very interesting is to read what Master Samael on Vior stated about the Buddha Shakyamuni. After the Buddha Shakyamuni performed his great work here and provided his doctrine to humanity, he went to Mars and taught his doctrine there for the population of that planet. And in fact, this is where he became a Christified Buddha. The Buddha Shakyamuni became the Christ of the population of Mars, the Savior. So nowadays, the stellar zodiacal influence of Mars is Christic Buddhic. It is a union of the Christic forces and Buddhic forces. Meditate on that. This doctrine of Gnosis is a Martian doctrine. In other words, it is projected from the ray of Ares, the warrior of Mars. That great general who wages war against the ego. But that Martian energy is a combination of the Buddha's doctrine and the Christic doctrine. Not only that, but Samael on Vior stated that in the future, he will go to Asia in order to accomplish a great mission, to teach humanity the, nece- the, necess- the necessity to fuse the Buddhist and Christic teachings. And he says, after all, Gnosis is Christic and Buddhist esotericism integrated. Now, the Buddha Shakyamuni does not just sit up in heaven. The Buddha Shakyamuni is a great bodhisattva. And the term bodhisattva refers to someone who has renounced nirvana for the benefit of humanity. So the Master Samael on Vior stated that the Buddha Shakyamuni has had other manifestations in humanity to assist humanity. One of those was about 50 years after the death of the Gautama Buddha, where he came back as, um, uh, what's the guy's name? Shankar, Shankarya. Shankar Sharya, something like that. He's the, the great teacher who established Vedanta. But his original teaching was there in order to fuse Hinduism and Buddhism to show that they are the same. And the reason is, first, when the Buddha was teaching in the form of Gautama, he was teaching the doctrine of no self in order to uproot the, mis- the misled Brahmanic tradition, the Hindu tradition. And when he came back as uh, Shankararya, whatever, I can't remember the name. It's kind of a complicated name. When he came back, Shankan, Shankar Sharya, Shankar Charya, yeah, 
something like that. He came in order to demonstrate that Buddhism and Hinduism are really one. Nowadays, the Vedanta tradition is once again confused. But the Buddha Gautama came again as Tsongkhapa. Tsongkhapa was the great reformer in the Tibetan tradition. Tsongkhapa was the great teacher who came in order to reestablish the Buddha's doctrine after it had fallen into decline in Tibet. And his student became the first Dalai Lama. So Tsongkhapa is credited with establishing that lineage of the Dalai Lamas. But Samael Anvior states that Tsongkhapa is an embodiment, an incarnation of Buddha Shakyamuni. What does that mean? That means a Gnostic student should study the works of Tsongkhapa. The Gnostic student should study the Buddhist doctrine. Shankaracharya is the name. And he established the Advaita Vedanta philosophy. Now, to demonstrate how profound the integration is with Christianity and Buddhism within Gnosis, I want to read you one passage from Samael Anvior, and then we'll open up for questions. To understand this, we need to understand that Gnosis is a practical doctrine. When we study all these things, it's not just to absorb theories and to intellectualize about history or about religion. We study this information so we can grow the Buddha nature inside, so we can activate our own essence and comprehend the nature of our own mind. To do that requires that we understand the teachings of the Buddha and the teachings of the Christ. The reason is the Buddha Dharma is the doctrine whereby you can come to know your own inner Buddha. You can reach that level to develop a Buddha inside of you. And this level corresponds to the monad, to develop our own inner spirit into a Buddha. But that Buddha has to become Christified. That Buddha has to advance and incarnate the Christ. That's how Buddha and Jesus, or Buddha and Christ, complement one another. They are stages of initiation, stages of the process of becoming fully liberated from the mind. To do that, we have to perform certain things. We have three factors which provide the basis of our teaching. These are birth, death, and sacrifice. These three are perfectly represented in the life of the Buddha. And if you look at his 12 stages, they are the apostle, the 12th arcanum. And the meaning of that arcanum is sacrifice. To sacrifice for others. The accomplishment of the three factors occurs when we work in chastity to transmute the sexual forces, when we work in sanctity to destroy the ego and the forces of, of uh, sacrifice, charity, to help others. The ultimate goal of this comprehension the fusion of these three factors is found in this statement made by Samael Anvior. It is only possible to arrive at the experience of reality when all thought has stopped. The emergence of the void, the emptiness, shunyata, allows us to experience the bright light of pure reality. That knowledge present in the reality of the emptiness without characteristics or color, the void of nature is the true reality 
universal kindness. Your intelligence, whose true nature is the emptiness, which should not be seen as the void of nothing, but as your very intelligence without shackles, brilliant, universal, and happy, is the consciousness, the universal wise Buddha. Your own void conscience and brilliant and joyful intelligence are inseparable. Its union is the Dharmakaya, the state of perfect illumination. Your own brilliant consciousness, empty and inseparable from the great body of splendor, does not have a birth or death and is the immutable light Amitabha Buddha. This knowledge is enough. To recognize the emptiness of your own intelligence as the state of Buddha and consider it as your own consciousness is to continue on the divine spirit of Buddha. Keep your intellect calm without being distracted during meditation. Forget that you are in meditation. Do not think that you are meditating because when one thinks that he's meditating, this thought is enough to disturb the meditation. Your mind should become empty in order to experience what is real. Any questions? Yeah, the 49 days at the base of the tree, does, is that related to the 49 levels of the uh, ego? The 49 levels of the mind, exactly. The Buddha spends 49 days at the base of the tree in order to... S- purify all the 49 levels of the mind in meditation. Any other questions? When in the process of the path do we incarnate our inner Buddha? The question is about incarnating our inner Buddha. When does that happen? When the initiate reaches the fourth degree of the initiation of fire, this is the fourth major mystery, the innermost, which is Chesed, becomes a Buddha. But that Buddha does not incarnate into the initiate until the ego is dead. Portions of the monad incarnate. The divine spirit, the divine soul incarnates. But not until the ego is 100% dead, is the inner master fully there to express itself? Question? In the tree of life, what is the Buddha and what is Christ? On the tree of life, typically when we talk about the Buddha as an entity inside of ourselves, there are different levels. Commonly, we, we point to chesed, as our own inner Buddha. But in reality, our own inner Buddha, Chesed, has his own inner Buddha, who is Adi Buddha, who is the emptiness, who is Kater and beyond. So there are levels of understanding what the Buddha is in us. Christ is the Ein Sof, that Christic energy which descends through Chokmah and is the universal intelligence which give rise to life. Christ is in synthesis these top three spheres, Keter, Chokmah, Bina. But its most beautiful atoms, its most beautiful manifestations come through Chokmah. And those manifestations are what we call Bodhisattvas. So Christ in us, in the tree of life, when we take that initiation to become a real bodhisattva is when chokmah manifests itself through tiferet, the human soul. Another question? Where can you read about how uh, Buddha and Shakyamuni redeemed the Martian moon? What book? That's in uh, one of the astrology books. When you, if you want to read about how the Buddha... Shakyamuni redeemed the Martian humanity. I believe that's in, um, it's either uh, the Zodiacal course or the Esoteric course of Hermetic Astrology. 
I think it's, yeah, it's a zodiacal course that's in there. Yeah, it's been suggested that it's it's just mentioned in that chapter, and if you really want to know about it, go into Samadhi. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yes. Are the, are the 12 steps related to the labors of Hercules? The question is, are the 12 steps related to the 12 labors of Hercules? Well, they are in the sense that the number 12 is an organizing principle in the same way that we have 12 apostles. We have 12 zodiacal signs, 12 labors of Hercules, but they're not directly related. The 12 labors of Hercules are related to the works of the second and third mountains, where the 12 stages of the Buddha's life are related to much more than that. They encompass more than just those second and third mountains. Is there another question? What is the purpose of when they go through the period of austerity? Mm-hmm. That they, I mean, do they have to see the extreme to know the middle? Right. Like, Right, the question is about, is it necessary to experience the period of austerities, those extremes, in order to understand them? The symbol in the context of the life of the Buddha is there to represent the extremes of our own existence and how our own mind tends to work in this kind of pendulum of extremes. My own understanding is that it's not necessary for us to become an extreme ascetic in order to understand that that is not necessary. Some people do. Some people enter into that until they understand that. But you don't have to experience in your physical life those kind of austerities in order to understand that they're not necessary. You can understand that in meditation. In the same way, you don't have to you know, commit a crime in order to understand that a crime is wrong. But in terms of karma, we all have latent tendencies which push us to one side of an extreme or another. And oftentimes, because we're so ignorant, we don't grasp the futility of our activities on one extreme or another until we have that kind of experience. So for example... You know, you may be reacting in a very strong way to someone who's talking to you about something. You might become very offended. And then later realize that that was just your mind. What they were saying was not offensive. It was you reacting and going to this extreme reaction. And, and you wouldn't have grasped that without the experience of it. So there are cases where, due to our karma and due to our ego, we have to experience certain things. But don't take it like you have to go become an aesthetic and deny yourself food in order to comprehend the, the truth of that. If the water doesn't boil to 100 degrees, that which has to be disintegrated is not disintegrated. Right. That's necessarily the extreme, the emotional, that has to reach that level, uh, which is that stream, but it's, it's played by your being. Right. So the example is given of, in order for an element to be purified, for example, if you've got impurities in water, you have to boil that water for a period of time in order to destroy those impurities. And the same is true of our mind. What boils the water in us is ordeals, difficulties in life. And the one who gives that to us is our being. But in the story of the Buddha, this is symbolized when Mara comes to attack the Buddha, to present him with all kinds of demons attacking him, all kinds of maidens who are trying to seduce him, all the different situations and challenges that the initiate inevitably has to face in order to overcome their own suffering, to overcome their own mind. That kind of ordeal is a necessity. But that's not self-imposed. That's not us deciding to go and look for those ordeals, to look for those problems. Those are brought by the nature of our own karma under the guidance of the being. This brings up a very interesting point. The, the Master Samael, in order to help his students to grasp the nature of the psychological work, made the suggestion that you should take a defect, a quality in yourself that you want to change, and work on it for a period of time. And this is a very useful practice in the beginning. 
But he also states repeatedly that the one who organizes the psychological work is the being. And the being does that by presenting us with ordeals. The student who has sufficient maturity to understand self-observation, self-remembering, and meditation will be given ordeals in accordance with the need. And the being is the one who determines that. In other words, the more mature student doesn't need to pick a defect and work on that. The mature student needs to observe their life and meditate on what's happening every day. Because the being is bringing ordeals every day. And if you're focused exclusively on your one defect, you will miss the work that your being is bringing you every day. So it's not to say that focusing on one defect is wrong. It's useful. But don't become a victim of tunnel vision. Now, this, what, the reason I mention this is it's, it's, a clear, it's a clear problem for some students who adopt a, a very intellectual method of analyzing the ego, who intellectualize about the structure of their own ego, who develop a kind of map, a diagram of their ego. And they begin to try to work on the ego from that point of view, intellectually. And that also becomes a belief. They believe they have a certain chief feature. They believe certain egos work in certain ways. This is a limitation, which is self-imposed. In order to really comprehend your ego, to really overcome your karma, you have to have an open mind without any artifice, without any self-imposed limitation. You can't say to yourself, I know that my main problem is pride. Because it's your pride that's saying that. What you should be doing is observing without thought. Just observing yourself. And whatever ordeals arise in life, you observe it. You analyze it in meditation. And you comprehend the nature of each situation as a matter of course, from ordeal to ordeal just following the train of events that your being brings into your life. This is the road to real comprehension. And the purpose of doing it in that way is to follow the guidance of the being, the inner Buddha, who works through intuition, who works through spontaneity. The mind, the intellect, cannot fix itself. Only our inner Buddha can guide us to be fixed, to, to repair our psyche. The, the nature of how our ego manipulates us is so profound, so strong, that our intellect is very easily fooled. Our emotions are very easily fooled. Our instinct, which sometimes feels like intuition, is very easily fooled. So I mention that so that the students who are trying to approach the psychological work from a sort of rigid, intellectual way can let go of that and learn to simply observe themselves and meditate on what they observe and not intellectualize so much. And they'll find that through intuition, the Buddha, inner Buddha, will guide the student. Any other questions? Why do they not write things down and track your time? <laughs> well, the question is, why didn't they write things down in Shakyamuni's time? I don't know. I could guess. My suspicion is that as practical meditators and as people who were trying to live a doctrine, the focus was not on a literal word. In the same way that in Asian mentality, they don't look for the literal facts, like the literal year someone was born. Asian culture typically doesn't care what they care about is the meaning. This is why when you read, for example, uh, if you go and try and look up a biography of any saint in Asia, the biographies are not biographies like you find in the West. The Eastern biographies are full of beautiful stories that are very elaborate, but have no basis in factual evidence. They're more like mythologies. 
And in the same way, the doctrine is approached in a, in a more kind of intuitive and, and fantastical way. Not so literal, not so concrete. The thing is because they were not believers, but practical. Right. And that's the other aspect too. The doctrines that flourished under the guidance of the Buddha at that time were given for practitioners. And when you're practicing something, you don't need to write it down. You know, when you're when you're really, when you really know how to do something, you don't have to write it out. You just know how to do it. If you know how to drive a car, you don't have to write out how to drive it. You just show somebody and they get it and then they can teach somebody else. It's really the same with meditation and self-observation. The written materials were developed later. So, I'm guessing about why they didn't. But any other questions? Okay. Okay, thank you all. Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.